Hello, Gaston County. Welcome to episode number 63 of Gaston's Great, a podcast highlighting some of the great things happening in and around Gaston County. I'm your host, Stephen Long, and we are coming to you once again from the international headquarters of GSM Services right here in downtown Gastonia as we look forward to having continued great discussions in the coming weeks and months. We seem to believe in discussing more of the reasons why Gaston's great. We have a very special episode today, or at least I'm calling it a very special uh, episode. It's a little different format than we uh, normally have. So we're going to talk about an upcoming event that's kind of near and dear to my heart and to the people in the room today um, called Crowd Out Polio, which is an event that the Rotary Club of Gastonia puts puts on. And full disclosure, I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Gastonia, so pretty much that's why we're talking about that event. Um, but we also have a, a special guest as well today. So we have Mark Hanna with us, who is a polio survivor, along with his daughter and fellow Rotarian, Katie Blackman, who is the executive director of Gaston Hospice. So if you want to go check out episode number 38, is an episode uh, about Gaston Hospice. We also have Marcia Scheidemann with us, who is a also a member of the Rotary Club of Gastonia and a Rotarian extraordinaire. She has got it going on when it comes to Rotary. So Mark, Katie, and Marsha, it's great to have you on, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to get right to it, and um, something that we do to try to start every episode is just, if you guys don't mind, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Mark. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and anything you'd like to share, but, and then we'll ask uh, you know, Marsha and Katie to do the same thing. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a retired social studies teacher at the high school level, and uh, I'm 74. Uh, I've been married for 52 years oh, to, wow. the, to the same person. <laughs> and, uh, father of two, uh, Katie is one, and John, uh, my son, is another, and I have four grandchildren, and that, that's kind of me. Okay, very good. Marsha, what about you? Well, I am also retired, um, retired dietitian and nonprofit executive director, um, and member, as you said, of the Rotary Club of Gastonia, have lived in North Carolina for only about 10 years, okay. so retired here. I have one grown son who is in the Navy, so. Very good. Katie, what about you, ma'am? All right. Katie Blackman, director with Gaston Hospice and Palliative Care, and I am Mark Hanna's daughter, born and raised here in Gaston County, and also a Rotarian, and look forward to talking about this event. All right, very good. Now, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention, I mentioned the Gaston Hospice episode, but actually our third episode we ever recorded was uh, about the Rotary Club, specifically the Rotary Club of Gastonia. We had uh, the president at the time of the club, and then the the, the immediate past president. So again, there's two other episodes you listeners can go um, and, and check out related, a little related to, to this episode. So um, Mark, can you kind of maybe just tell us if you can, what you're comfortable sharing about kind of your experience with polio, you know, anything you're, you know, uh, comfortable sharing. And then maybe I even maybe go over to Katie after that to maybe she can add some insight into to that experience. Cause again, we're, we're specifically what we're talking about today. Now, I'm sure she can. <laughs> I actually had the disease uh, during the polio uh, epidemic uh, as an infant. Uh, I was born in April, but I believe I got sick somewhere around August okay. and about four months old. And uh, don't really, obviously, d- don't remember much about the disease in that part. Uh, my earliest memories were my trips to the orthopedic hospital okay. to see Dr. Roberts and Dr. Miller for, Miller for follow ups. Right. And uh, they were two prominent, uh, just top of the line uh, in their field and uh, very renowned. Uh, one thing I remember about that is, is when I went into the orthopedic hospital, uh, most of you have seen images of polio victims and especially uh, braces and iron lungs. Yes. And at the orthopedic hospital, uh, there was a lot of that. Uh, I was told uh, by my father that I was in a ward when I was admitted uh, with six uh, of a ward of six children, and I was the only one that survived. Oh wow! Uh, that it's kind of chilling when you think about it. Sure is. Uh, but the th- the best biggest thing I remember was when I walked in, uh, seeing all the other people who were so much worse off than me. That made a a real impact on me. 
what happened to me, I had muscle loss. I lost my muscle in my deltoid and tricep and rotator cuff, and so my shoulder uh, is – I can't lift my arm above my waist basically uh, anymore. Uh, but that is not apparent to anybody, you know, who sees me. And uh, being around people who struggle to be mobile really made an impact. And uh, I didn't understand it as much then, of course, as I do now. Right. And uh, one story my dad told me later also was that when he took me back for checkups and follow-ups, that we always went in a back door. And... Of course, I don't remember that, but he said that it was it kind of embarrassed him to bring me in for a <laughs> checkup in front of all the people with all the disabilities that were so uh, uh, more tragic than mine, and uh, he was sort of embarrassed, you know, to do right. that. So he so he took me in more discreetly. I thought <laughs> that was the way he would say. Uh, also, remember Dr. Miller, who examined me. he would stretch his palm out to me and tell me to take my right arm and push against it. And, of course, I would do that, and he would get angry with me, and he would fuss at me, and he said, I told you to push, boy, and I would cry and uh, <laughs> push as hard as I could. And, it, it, again, it wasn't until later life that it occurred to me that all that was really clinical, that he was trying to make sure I push with my greatest effort. Right. He could evaluate my muscle strength accurately. So uh, that was pretty hard to take at the time, and I, ne- I didn't like him at all. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we went back a lot, and uh, That's maximum effort was what he was looking for. <laughs> he didn't care if he made me cry. Uh, but, again, my disability was so unnoticeable that a lot of my friends today have no idea that right. I have polio. Uh, every once in a while I have to explain to them that I do, and somebody will ask me a question, well, you sure do that funny? <laughs> and I said, well, it's the only way I can get it done. Uh, but about 40, at about 40 years of age, uh, post-polio syndrome began to affect me. And being a classroom teacher, uh, I, of course, I, I write right-handed and wrote on the board right-handed. And when post-polio syndrome hit me, I began to weaken significantly okay. in my arm and shoulder area. And... Things I could do, I began not to be able to do. So I, I had to learn to write on the board left-handed. Oh, wow. Which made for some pretty uh, awful <laughs> writing. But uh, you know, over time, I, I did okay. But uh, again, post-polio, my understanding it, standing is that it affected uh, the more visibly stricken people more than it did me. I experienced a weakening, and my understanding is that a lot of the other survivors uh, experienced a lot of pain with post-polio. And again, they also began to weaken, and uh, it was uh, another kind of a traumatic thing for them that, that I experienced part of, but not to the depth that they did. And uh, part of that is also, I had... I had I began to understand how lucky I was, right? Because at the same time I could curse my condition. Uh, when I stepped back and analyzed everything, uh, I, I was really lucky that I could function the way I could. And uh, now uh, it's a lot worse. But uh, it, it's Katie and I talk every once in a while about how funny it is that you have to adapt what you do and you have sure. to learn how to do things. When I drive, I can't reach the radio. I can't reach the, the uh, air conditioning, the, the heat, and, and all the controls that I have to do with my right hand. Mm. So I have, I've had to learn to put my hand on my thigh and bounce it. Oh, and then that's boom over to the, to the <laughs> gear shift or whatever I'm doing. And uh, things like that, uh, they're, they're inconvenient and they're aggravating sometimes. But then it, it's kind yeah. of really funny about how you adapt <laughs> and how you do things differently. I, when I put on a jacket or a shirt or things like that, sometimes I have to sling my arm <laughs> around, and people, if they looked at me, would say, oh, that's crazy looking. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just 
again, it's it's ways you uh, adapt it. And any person that has a physical uh, ailment, you know, would do the same thing. Right. And sometimes you do it unconsciously. Uh, it's just, I know Katie could probably, you know, say a few things about, you know, her growing up. We we never talked about it. Okay. Uh, and uh, was that intentional? Or you just you know, there's just something that just didn't come up, or you didn't really want to. wasn't wasn't much intent about it. It was okay. just that it didn't matter, right? And so we we just uh, it's not that we avoided it, but when it was time to talk about it, of course we'd mention it. But as far as uh, okay, you know, making an excuse or anything like that. Okay, anything you want to add to that with your experience as a as a reiterate yeah. that that was just how he lived. He just yeah. adapted as it happened and didn't know until I was an adult looking back some of the things that he had gone through as he the post polio syndrome had gotten worse and how he'd adapted and I just remember the first time I noticed how he would throw his hand up to get to the radio and I that's I, the first conscious moment where I think we had the conversation about what what's going on here <laughs> and then you know having to switch from he always drove a manual a straight drive and when he had to switch to an automatic, mm. um, and it was because of that, and I didn't, you know, really put that together until mm. we talked about it later. That's interesting. Uh, a couple things. Well, we heard a lot there. Um, one thing that I would here it is twenty twenty two, and people, frankly, people my age, um, we just really didn't have to deal with that, right? We we, I mean, I knew of it, right, because we had the polio vaccine when we were younger. And um, there were, I mean, I did meet some, some individuals who either had the, you, you knew that had polio when they were younger or whatever, but it was just something that we just, here in, a, here in the U.S. anyway, we just don't deal with. And then I also think a lot of people don't realize um, how important, you know, the orthopedic hospital here was and not just and how well known it was. And that's one of those things. It's kind of like uh, some other examples, maybe like the Shield Museum. There's something we take for granted because it's here. Right. We we don't realize how big of a deal that is um, regionally or or even even nationally. Um, it's kind of difficult for people like me to ride by and see it in disrepair and see, oh, yeah. it, mm-hmm. see it changing because uh, I never go by it without looking up and remembering. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. So. Um, it's such a, you know, and to your point about adapting, I, I think my experience is that it, it is, the things we can't adapt to is almost limitless. I mean, it's not, there's always limitations, but we do just kind of, um, what's, whatever's necessary, right, in, in our day, especially in our day-to-day um, lives. So, you know, knowing that there may be somebody listening who has a family member or, or maybe somebody not just, obviously not with polio necessarily, but some kind of, ailment or illness or their family what what would you tell somebody with your experience knowing what you've experienced kind of your words of encouragement or how would you you know say this is this helped me get through it or it sounds like you just said heck with it i'm just gonna live my life and not get on with it right (laughs) well that's kind of it but yeah uh, i've never considered myself an optimist at all (laughs) I, i really don't know the words to describe i'm not really a pessimist that's what uh, a realist, well, okay. I, I kind of call it a pragmatist. That you know, you approach those things with, uh, well, this is what it is. Let's yes, let's see what to do. And uh, I knew it wasn't going to go away, and so I had to adapt. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I considered myself lucky, and I played baseball as a, a child, not very good, but <laughs> still, play, I played baseball. I, I played and coached tennis uh, for years, and uh, just did things that I could do and uh, found things that I could do and enjoy. And uh, I think that part, you know, going back to what we said about paying attention to it, that came from mom and dad too. Uh, they never, they didn't ignore it, but they, but we just didn't talk about it. We just went about our business. Sure. And that's where I think if, if mom had treated me like, oh, poor son, or poor oh, son yeah. you know, I would yeah. have had a whole different attitude. And my father the same way. You know, we just never. Uh, What's the phrase that you, now? Um, oh, uh, that vict- victim mentality, right? That that yeah. can be easy. It can easily that can easily happen because um, everything's relative, right, to your own situation. Yeah, and, and if I could, you know, tell somebody uh, with a disability, 
that just go about living and loving and, you know, just uh, attack life head on. All right. So, you know, normally I end the podcast with some type of quote or something. Uh, we may just have had it right there, you know. Um, I don't have to pull that, snip that one out of the out of the podcast that was a that was really good so um so maybe listen out there so why why are we talking about polio today why are we talking about this topic why why does why do I have rotarians here and, and a gentleman who is a polio survivor so i'm going to sh- kind of maybe shift real quick to marcia the rotarian extraordinaire and um i mean i know i, I know a little bit uh, enough about rodeo r- rodeo rotary and polio to be dangerous but marcia kind of um can you tell us about Rotary's maybe general involvement in polio eradication, how some, how some of that came about, and, and then the specifically, you know, the event that our club has uh, coming up, and, and just what, what are we trying to accomplish with that? Sure. Um, I, I will um, initially just take a minute. I'm three years younger than you are, Mark, <laughs> and my recollection is taking the sugar cube. Mm-hmm. I remember lining up yeah. at school and receiving that sugar cube. And, so, and we yeah. did too, just a little late. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Yeah, but, yeah. but anyway, that's my recollection mm-hmm. of, of polio as a child. But Rotary's involvement in polio is massive. Um, it began um, back in 1979 when we actually went to the Philippines and immunized six million children and has grown exponentially since then. Um, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation getting involved in the early 2000s, which has really um, given us an opportunity to grow the funds. They were willing to provide a two-to-one match. So every dollar that that we donated to the effort, they donated two in return. So over the years, um, we have actually contributed over $2 billion (laughs) um, to the eradication of polio. And oh, by the way, Bill Gates insisted that Rotary be part of the picture when he was asked um, to help. To be clear, that's Rotary, the Rotary Foundation and Rotary broadly uh, in the world, not the Rotary Club of Gastonia giving $2 billion. Well, that's correct. (laughs) But But we're part of it. We've been part of that. We've been part of it. Um, But the reason that Bill Gates was so insistent on on Rotary being part of that whole effort was that we were the boots on the ground. Right. We actually provided the infrastructure. And um, so over two, as I said, over $2 billion, countless volunteer hours. We have Rotarians that go overseas and give children the vaccine. Um, and um, over 2.5 billion children right. have been vaccinated in our efforts. So we try to keep that momentum going every year in October. Um, most Rotary Clubs do some kind of event, and the Rotary Club of Gastonia two years ago came up with um, a- an event that we call Crowd Out Polio because of being geographically here in Gastonia. Um, we have, as you said, Mark, the, the orthopedic hospital in our history, but we also have Crowder's Mountain. So um, we wanted people to have an opportunity to be active, to take advantage of the natural resource of Crowder's Mountain. And so they can um, enter, um, register to walk, hike, or run, or crawl, (laughs) however they want to do it, one of the paths um, at Crowder's Mountain anytime after the 8th of October. And then we have a culminating event on Saturday the 22nd just to celebrate. Um, The other way that people can contribute to the effort is just through a simple donation. Um, You can go on our website, crowdoutpolio.com, and just donate to the effort. Um, Or um, companies can sponsor provide some sponsorship. So there are three different ways to contribute. To so we'll make sure before we finish, you know, well, we're, the last thing we'll talk about is re- reiterate the website mm-hmm. and how um, we can get, you know, others can get involved mm-hmm. and, and um, make sure that that's clear. And so, yeah, uh, uh, Marsha just shared, shared a lot. Um, one, you know, one question I get asked, Cage, I'm happy, I happen to be the, um, the club trainer for our club. So I'm getting uh, new members through our orientation 
uh, program. And a question I'm asked occasionally is, well, why does it keep taking so much money? You know, we've, we've basically, you know, I think wild polio and Marsh, you may know better than me. I think it's down to two countries consistently. Now there are occasional, you know, for lack of a better term, occasional breakout or something here because of travel and, and there, there can be small pockets, uh, but that's typically not wild polio. That's just happening. But, um, seems like it's, um, Pakistan and Afghanistan. No, that's correct. C- correct. And that's Pakistan correct. is very close, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. with very few cases each year. And when I joined our club, we still had Nigeria and um, India mm-hmm. were still on the list. And that's been 21 years ago now, mm-hmm. how long I've been in Rotary. And those have been taken off the list. Um, so, so the, a lot of work has been done, but there's still children being born all over the world, mm-hmm. right? That, that in some areas that are hard to access. So that is why that the, the, the money being raised now is still needs to be done year to year, year, to year so we can get to those children and, and prevent, um, you know, because, you know, again, the goal is polio eradication when Rotary, and it's not just Rotary, it's uh, UNICEF originally, I think, was involved in the World Health Organization. So, but Rotary was really the catalyst, and because we're in Rotary, that's what we're going to focus on and talk about um, today. So, um, It'd be nice if we didn't have to have this event, right? And, and Rotary was <laughs> sure was, was no. Um, you all right, Amy? You throwing things around over there in the middle of our podcast? All right. Okay, just checking. So, and so many of the podcasts we've had, that is kind of the, the ultimate goal would be not to have to have these organizations any longer. So, you know, is this, the, 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 you're so heavily involved with it. Do you anticipate this being an ongoing event? And we've, this is year number three, and it seems to be gaining momentum every year, and and looking ahead, what do you see for the event? It, it is gaining momentum. Um, we are increasing our the goal that we want to raise each year, and we have risen to the occasion, at least in the first two years. Right. Um, hopefully, we will this year as well. As you said, it's an ongoing issue internationally. Right. Um, so that the two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, it is still endemic in those right. countries. So that children being born, we have to make a really in- incredible effort to vaccinate them because there are cultural barriers and there are you political, know, political and barriers. Yep. And until we don't take the polio vaccine anymore in our country um, because we have eradicated it. Right. So we don't need to un- unless it comes back which it could yes, um, yeah. um it's only we we like to say it's only an airplane ride away correct yeah i mean matter of fact just within the past few weeks i read something about new york or somewhere in new york there was a small that's correct and i and not being a, 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 a an expert on it i don't remember how you would describe it but yeah there was something in the headlines with some with a few cases here uh but I think it, I think it was from travel or, or something related to that. Um, there was a there was a case in Rockland County, New York, which is right outside the city, um, in a in an unvaccinated community. Gotcha. This Thank gentleman you. had contracted it overseas, brought it back home. Gotcha. And now they're testing the drink the water, and mm. they're finding it the wild virus in the oh, water. Nice. So that's the concern. Good, great. So. Um, so, you know, something we talk about, you know, this is, this is Gaston, podcast, you know, it's called Gaston's Great, right? So, we're trying to focus on things, the good things happening around here. So, why, um, this is maybe a question for all of you, but maybe start with you, Marsha, because you're so heavily involved with the event. I mean, why would you um, say Gaston County specifically is better because, you know, we have both our Rotary Club and we're doing this event here in, in Gaston County? Well, outside the history um, of Gaston County being involved in um, polio treatment or eradication, um, clearly we want it. We want Gastonians to take advantage of the natural resources at their disposal, like Crowder's Mountain. So it's just, it's just a good way to encourage people to um, to get outside, to yeah. um, participate in something healthy. Um, and enjoy their their community. Yeah, are there any other organizations I'm trying to think in the last ten or fifteen years that even talk about polio any longer? Or is it is this pretty is Rotary at least here in America, is that pretty much it? Or Rotary has certainly taken the lead. Um, there is an international initiative which includes a lot of different organizations. Right. Clearly, the United Nations is concerned and, and interested, but Rotary has really taken the lead, um, probably because of the Gates Foundation. Sure, 
Sure. Um, so before we move on to some really important questions, um, anything I haven't asked, for this is for all three of you, you know, uh, Mark or Marsha or, or Katie, anything I haven't asked, anything that you'd like to share, any, any, you know, related to the event, to polio in general, or any, any other, anything else we've got going on? There may not have it. You guys have really covered it very well. Um, and it's a really uh, impactful story, Mr. Hanna. I, I can't think of anything. Okay. You know, that I will I say that for those who don't think that polio is a, an issue, and it's not in, in, in our particular country, um, Rotary International and the Rotary Foundation, their initiative is called Polio Plus. Right. So there are other communicable diseases right. which are addressed, um, clean water, Ebola, you know, because we have the infrastructure internationally. Yeah, that's a great point. And, yeah. and specifically the polio plus two, is, 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 it's that, but it's also just the inoculation itself includes all the whole, I had the diphtheria, uh, and tuberculosis and maybe. Exactly. There's, there's multiple things that are included in that. And I have that list when I go through orientation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I specifically you, know, you touch on for, for new Rotarians. So we're going to call this, um, we changed the name of this little round of questions, uh, and you're not going to get out of this, Katie, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we, we're going to call this the crowd out polio speed round of questions, all right? And we're going to start with you, Katie, because you're trying to hide down there on the other end without <laughs> being involved. So, Katie, what is your favorite Tony's ice cream flavor? Chocolate. Marsha? Have you been to Tony's? I went to Tony's yesterday Just to prepare <laughs> for today. I want to, full disclosure, All yes, right. I went to Tony's yesterday, and I had chocolate peanut butter ripple. Oh, okay. So you've been once, and that's the only answer you can give. That's, that's the, the only, only proof. Answer? That's the only proof that you have that's at this right. point. Uh, Mark? Uh, black cherry with... Uh, Close second butter pecan. Oh, oh wow. wow! Okay, so I got a. We when we had the GBA on the Gatsby Association on. Gosh, many many episodes ago, we had a live taste testing of um, of Tony's ice cream and black cherry was one of the was one uh, grape and something else. I don't remember. Oh, it was lemon because I was like lemon, but <laughs> um, but the second piece of that uh mark is my dad's favorite was was butter pecan is that right absolutely sure, sure. i mean he he absolutely loved that um stick with you marks are you sun drop or cheer wine definitely sun drop okay marcia is going to we're going to cut her mic off here in a minute because she's only been to tony's once and now she's never had sun drop or cheer wine so she's only been here for 10 years or so you know <laughs> we'll give her a break i'll bring you some <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Sun drop. Sun drop. All right. So, Katie, stay with you. Favorite local restaurant? Uh, Black's Barbecue. Oh, ah, very good. Webb's Kitchen. Webb's Custom Kitchen. Yeah, definitely. I think Hickory Tavern. Oh, ah, Hickory Tavern. Very good. That's a lot of good sports there, too. Um, so, we're going to cheat here. The favorite outdoor activity in Gaston County. We can't say hiking Crowder's Mountain <laughs> because we're talking about Crowder Polio. We're going to assume that's everybody's favorite activity. But... Uh, Mark, how about your favorite outdoor activity or favorite park or something you might do here? Well, it's it's kind of uh, benign, but uh, my my favorite time to be outdoors is uh, my sister lives on Lake Wiley. Oh, okay. And we go down and pontoon. Oh, that's the fantastic! Lake and yeah. everything, and uh, it, it's uh, it's just very relaxing, very peaceful. Very good. I appreciate that. That's good, Marcia. My husband and I have in the past um, hiked around the Rankin Lake. Oh, Rankin Lake's yeah, really nice. Yeah, yeah, really pretty. Not, not too far from here either. Mm -hmm. Really nice spot. Katie? I'd have to agree with Lake Wiley, but if I had to choose a second, it's taking the kids to the pool at Limburger Park. Oh, uh, okay. Have mm, a good cool. time there. Yeah, so I, my dad actually grew up on um, Avon Street, which is um, at the time right across from the baseball field. And, of course, the house isn't there any longer. And I grew up on Fern Forest Drive, so – and my grandmother lived on Fourth Street, so we kind of had Limburger Park surrounded. <laughs> and, I, and I grew up, I, I grew up on uh, uh, going to Limburger Park quite a bit. And we grew up on Sixth Street. Oh yeah, yeah, so very right, up, right above Avon. Yeah, very close, very close. Um, so, Katie, we're going to stick with you, and this is you know this is my question that I get to ask every episode, and I don't really care what anybody thinks about it. But, Katie, UNC Duke or NC State? I'm going to have to go with NC State for my dad on that one. Give us something. All right. Very good. 
All right, Marcia. Well, being a Pennsylvania girl, I don't have a whole lot of affinity for North Carolina schools, but I'm very involved in cooperative extension, and NC State is yes. the land grant, so and, I've got to go with NC State. And you have red on in That's honor right. of NC State today, correct? <laughs> That's All right. All right, I'm going to assume the answer to this, but I'm going to ask anyway. Mark? Well, I went to NC State, and uh, my, my loyalty is still there. I don't even know what to do. We've never had all three guests, all get, every guest say <laughs> NC State. I mean, what a great day. Maybe the pod, maybe we're going to retire the podcast completely after this episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm an NC State grad myself, Mark. So um, mm, this is the best episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mark, um, you, you know, you've shared a lot already, so maybe this might be a tough one, but what is something very few people know about you? Uh, I, I really don't know, but uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't know that I'm an avid avid bridge player. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, that I uh, started when I was in college and, and lost my bridge game when I worked and had family. Uh, but after retirement, I picked it back up. Oh, and, well, good for you. And active around and, and really enjoy it. Yeah. I spent many of them as a kid, many a time at my friends and my parents' houses doing whatever while they were playing bridge <laughs> with their with their friends. Marsha, what about you? Um, well, as I said, I was, I'm was a Pennsylvania girl. I grew up in Pittsburgh, but I was born in Philadelphia, and not very many people know. Okay. So, I mean, are you a sports fan at all? or Steelers. So, okay. So, no Eagles, but Steelers. Hockey? Yep. Penguins as well? Or you don't Penguins, care about hockey? Penguins, yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. I'm, not sure what Pirates. Think. I'm not sure what to think about that. <laughs> We're going to move on to Katie. Probably that I'm an extreme introvert. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, welcome. All right, Katie, stick with you. Is there a book or something you would recommend or a blog or article you follow that, that our I listeners might enjoy? One of the best books I've read recently is Where the Crawdad Sings. It's pretty okay. uh, popular right now, but to, I'll have to go with the trend. All right, very good. I've heard that, but very I have to admit good. I'm not. that's not on my list. But That's <laughs> that's what I just finished reading really? as well. Yep. It's All right. Stuff. So they cheated and they yep. said the same thing, Mark. So you got to say something <laughs> different if there's something... Well, uh, I've got to where I read a lot, but one of the books that, that I look back on is one of my best reads ever. Uh, it's called Wilmington's Lie. Uh, it's by David Zucchino, and it's a, it chronicles the story of the 1898 Wilmington riots. And uh, it, it was just so informative and, mm. and so eye-opening okay. that uh, – I actually bought four copies and sent it to some friends. Oh, well, good. Yeah. And uh, one friend that lives out of town, and I, and I, I told him that uh, every native North Carolinian needs to have read that book because it's a, it's a, such a uh, strong statement about our state history. Well, I appreciate that. I'm, all, I'm re- always reading something, and so I'll, I'll, I'll add that to my list. I think, I think my wife has that. Uh, so you're not going to add ours to Well, no, well, that's, where, that that's where I was going. <laughs> that's where I was going. I don't have to add it to the list because it's already in my house somewhere, and I'm sure I will find it and glance at it sometime. <laughs> um, so, Mark, I'll stick with you on this next question first. Uh, so, you know, again, this is a, a podcast where we try to focus on Gaston County. So besides Rody Club of Gastonia, the crowd out, polio event, the things we've talked about today. Why would you say you know, Gaston County is such a great place? Well, for me, it's it's mostly about, when I think about that, it's mostly about family because, okay. you know, I was born and raised here. My family was born and raised here. My father, Mac, uh, actually worked almost his whole life right across the street from here at the city of Gastonia. He was yeah. he retired as a superintendent of the electric, electric department. And, you know, through those years, uh, I got to know a lot of people who uh, worked behind the scenes and who did so much to make Gaston uh, work for you know for everybody, and uh, I just think that it, in the uh, final analysis, Gaston is a, a very tight community, mm-hmm. and uh, the little municipalities around Gastonia that make it uh, all make it as great, you know, I, I yeah. just. I just always saw Gaston County as a close place. Appreciate that. I agree. We'll even slide in possibly a little Lincoln County as well there, <laughs> Marcia. But how would you answer that question? Well, as 
as you know, I live in Lincoln County, so my right. um, experience with Gaston County has been my friends at Rotary. And I would say that their passion for their community is is palpable. So it's very attractive. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, if, if I haven't learned anything in the past 63 episodes of this now, is that mm-hmm. ex- exact point? I have, We have met so many wonderful individuals who care deeply and are doing good work here in our in our community. Katie, how would you answer that question? I'd have to say family as well. That was what keeps me okay. here, mm-hmm. and it's what brought me back. It's one of those I swore I would never be back, and <laughs> here I am, and um, I'm enjoying it. I've got family right next door and friends and um, friends that are family. So. Oh, very good. All right, I think I say this every episode as well. This is my favorite question, and um, I'll start with you. Katie, um, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Be kind to yourself and be patient. Okay. That's very good. When I was 20, <laughs> patience was a, foreign, was, a, it was a foreign concept for sure. I would say be authentic. Don't okay. be afraid of who you are because I sure was. <laughs> <laughs> Try to... Make other people yeah. worry about what other people thought. and mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, boy. Mark? Well, first of all, I love the question. Uh, <laughs> this, I think about this more often than probably people would ever think I would. But uh, I know the kind of relating to this question, an article I read a couple of years ago, a North Carolina State assistant football coach published a letter that he wrote to his 16-year-old self or 14-year-old self or something, and it was so powerful and so... Uh, yeah, that was the... Um, gosh, I know, I, I've read it. I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't remember the, his name, but I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. He was a defensive backs coach, and yeah. he was just an incredible human being, and he's, yep. no, he's no longer there. But uh, uh, I think I would like to tell my 20-year-old self to be in more intentional about the acts that you do, the plans that you make. And I feel like sometimes we let life, we let life happen to us. <laughs> and I have kind of looked back and thought that I, more, I reacted to life more than I channeled my life. Understood. And so yeah. I would say be more intentional in raising your children, in your education, uh, your vision of what you want, your goals. I was never goal-oriented. And uh, I think I, I should have been more, but have a, have a vision for your life. Yeah, that question, um, I like the question for a lot of reasons. One of them is when we started this podcast, uh, my children, my oldest, were 22 and 20. So I'm thinking, boy, if I messed them up, you know, here it is. It's too late, but I got a, still got a 16-year-old that maybe we can, we can get into that 20-year-old self and, and, and help them. But I, that's, a, that's a terrific answer and three terrific answers because I'm afraid – some of that perspective just requires age and experience. Uh, you know, I, I'm afraid that it's almost impossible to have that real perspective when you're 20. You know, I just, because I sure didn't. Um, and I think every time I ask that question, you know, we've had so many terrific, gosh, answers and, and perspectives on that. And every single time I said, no, I didn't know that either. No, I didn't think that either. You know, every single, every single answer. So, uh, guys, this has really been good. Um, this is going to, I mean, th- 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 our listeners are really uh, going to enjoy hearing about this, both the event and, and your story. Um, so, and before we finish up, so obviously the main point is to make uh, make sure our listeners are aware of this event, how they can help, how they can donate. So, can you maybe just real last thing, Marcia, just share again uh, the website, uh, the day of the, the, the event, anything. Uh, listen, let's recruit some Rotarians while we're at it, you know. I mean, anything we can do here to help as this continues to be uh, an international, you know, um, uh, I- initiative that, that Rotary has? Well, we are giving people the option of walking, hiking, or climbing Crowder's Mountain any time between October 8th and the 22nd at, at their leisure. And they you go to the website, crowdoutpolio.com, and register to walk, and then you receive a T-shirt and a little bracelet Mm -hmm. and take a picture of yourself walking walking posted on facebook and you can enter a contest so in there um don't we always have a facebook 
page as well for we Crowd do. Out Polio? We do. Okay. And it's Crowd Out Polio. So and I guess, help me out, digital people, you would tag, that, take a picture and put it, post it on that site, or do you tag yourself, tag that website, I mean, that Facebook you, page? How do you do that? You can post it on the site. Okay. Yeah. You're not helping me over here, <laughs> people. All right, you know, you don't have microphones so nobody can hear you. So we'll have to put it in the show notes. Can we can we put it in the show notes? Yeah. Well, this is episode is winding down slowly. <laughs> so um, I'm going to do this because I wasn't, actually, I wasn't going to do this because uh, Mark's words were so powerful, but it kind of, and I'm reading it, it kind of relates, I think. You know, I do a book recommendation every week um, as well, and it's the book... Um, I just finished, actually. It's it's by a gentleman named Ryan Holiday, and it's called Ego is the Enemy. And it's just, um, we're big here at GSM. We try hard to have work with humility and empathy and, and compassion, and, boy, ego gets in the way of that. And uh, I think it's a good read if you're someone who's kind of looking to learn about that. And my quote this week is specifically on humility, and it comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, In my walks... Every man I meet is my superior in some way, and in that, I learn from him. So my experience, and sure wasn't at 20, I didn't realize this, but at 52, um, I have come to learn that every interaction that I have with someone, especially with somebody I've met for the first time, I can learn something from him, from that individual. And I sure have today, I I sure have the last 63 episodes of of doing these podcasts. So um, again, to our listeners out there, can't thank you enough for taking the time to listen to today's episode and all of our episodes. Please spread the word if you can about the podcast, and please don't hesitate to contact us here at our email address, which is podcast at gastonsgreat.com. We're always looking for suggestions for future podcast topics and guests. You can find the podcast and subscribe at our website, gastonsgreat.com, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And please follow us on all of our social media platforms as well. And apparently, according to our newest person on the podcast, Naomi, she says that if we give us good ratings, that we'll get noticed more. Is that correct, Naomi? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Thanks again to Mark, Katie, and Marsha for being our guests today. Gaston's Grady is produced and brought to you by Amy Anderson from GSM Services and edited here locally by the Sumner Group. I'm your host, Stephen Long. Thanks again for hanging out with us, and please keep coming back to hear more reasons why Gaston's great.